You know, his will is a choice. It's a choice. It's just, how can you, how can you pray even a prayer, you know, it says, not my will, but thine be done. Isn't that what Jesus prayed? Boy, and it, it I just, I just need to attack this concept. This is, this is all I've heard. How many of you know God's sovereign? Absolutely, 100% sovereign. He is sovereign. But if there was anything close to God on this planet, and he didn't come here as God, he came here as a man. But you'd have to say it was Jesus, right? You know, born from the very beginning with the life of God in him. And he was God made flesh. Now, if anybody would have had the right, the right to say my will, wouldn't you have thought it was him? But he said at the end, he says, not my will. What, what do you think the fight was about? Why do you think he had to pray? You know, he knew the will of God from the beginning. What he came here for. <laughs> you think it's coincidence that the very first thing he did when he came to John, he got baptized? What is, baptim what is baptism a symbol of? It's death. It's burial. And it's being raised to new life. He knew what he was doing right there. And John didn't, John didn't get, why are you having me baptize you? You ought to be baptizing me. He says, just, just trust me. <laughs> it's, it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness is what it says. And from that moment on, the moment he went in that water, he went around doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for. God was with him. Him who? God was with himself. God was with Jesus. God was with the man, Jesus. But even in the garden, you see him. Why did he have to pray? Why did he have, have his disciples come support him? Why? You don't sweat blood because you're having a good time. What's, what's going on? There's a conflict. Are you telling me that Jesus himself was conflicted about God's will? He was conflicted about wanting to do it. You don't fight and bleed because of stress. And I'm told that's actually a, a, a medical condition that you can have so much stress. It's under extreme stress that you can bleed. What's the fight about? He was praying. He prayed it a couple times. Why do you got to pray it a couple times? Because you, you're fighting something. Not my will but your be done. If there's any way that this cup can be taken away from me, didn't he say that? If there's any way, why? Because he didn't want to drink it. He didn't want to do it. Not my will, but yours be done. You got to get past something with God's sovereignty that says you don't have a choice. God isn't so sovereign that he makes you do what he wants. He's not. If, he, if Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. If Jesus had to submit his will, what makes you think you don't? God is sovereign. Amen. He is. He's sovereign. He sovereignly gave you the freedom to choose. He sovereignly said at the very beginning, didn't he say, let man have dominion? Do you think we got 66 books here? All the hoops God had to jump through. All the thousands of years he had to wait. All the people he had to use just to get his life back on this planet. Just to get life back. He had to go through Moses. Had to go through the prophets. Had to go through Abraham. Using their faith. Using their voice. Preserving a people that would hold the tenants of God. He had to go through all these hoops. He couldn't just up and create another man, Adam. Why, why don't you think that right after Adam fell, he popped in there and did something? 
Because he said, he sovereignly said. Everybody say sovereign. He sovereignly said, let them have dominion. There is this idea about God that somehow over, over your head and beyond yourself and like you're not part of things. Like apart from you, God's going to work. It has never been that way. Nothing in this book says it's that way. And Jesus died. Everybody say died. So that you could have the freedom to continue to follow God. He died. But it didn't make, he did, God did not make him. This is what's so powerful about what Jesus did. He chose. He chose. Didn't he say this? He says, I have the power to lay my life down and I have the power to take it up. You know, Pontius Pilate, you can't kill me. You Jews, you can't kill me. The only reason I'm going to the cross is because I have been told to and I want his will done, not mine. That's why he went. Do you know if he would have opened his mouth and said five words, he would have got out of there? Even into the garden, he says, don't you know I could call for, I don't know how many angels, how many it adds up to if you do the math? And, and I could be out of here, but he says, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? Now, I mean, you have thousands of years of prophecy of men and women of God who've proclaimed this is going to happen, and here Jesus says, I have a choice to Leave all that. Just be another dead religion. But Jesus chose. See, God is absolutely sovereign. But you have to understand part of you that's special, that's like him, that makes you his child, is that you have choice. You absolutely have will. You absolutely have freedom. And it is not part of the grander plan of God when you choose to do your own will. It's not. It's not. Now God can take what is evil and he can turn it around for good. He can take lemons and make lemonade. Everybody love those sayings? I give you one better. Don't give him the lemons to start with. Why don't you give him the submission? Why don't you yield? Why don't you obey? Because if God can use Pharaoh to bring about his will when he's resisting him, how much more can God bring about his will when you're submitting to him? I'm telling you, you have a part to play in this. And nobody's going to be able to answer for you except you. There is a submission to his will that's a fight. And it's your fight. I, nobody else can fight that fight for you. They can encourage you in it. They can help you. They can pray for you. But you have a fight. Everybody say fight. See, if Jesus had to fight his will, then you're going to have to fight your will. It's no coincidence, he said before the cross. Some, I don't know, anyway, I won't go into that. It's no coincidence, he said before the cross. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your own cross. You're going to have to, what, what kind of imagery is that? He hadn't gone to the cross yet. Imagine following Jesus, he says, you're going to have to pick up your cross. They all knew what that was. It was their death. It was his death. And he was giving them a pattern. He says, look, I'm not going to the cross to die. I'm already dead. I'm not living for myself every single day. <clears throat> One of the questions that the Holy Ghost has been asking me, because I have, anybody have passions, pursuits, things that they like, things that they enjoy? I, I, I have a lot of things. And I, if I was going to be completely honest, I have had, you know, I'll get interested in a certain subject or a certain hobby or a certain passion or a pursuit 
and it'll, it'll burn out for about three or four months. <laughs> you know, anybody else? Anybody? I'm not the only one that does this, right? <laughs> you get all of the gear or whatever that's required, or you do all the research, you get on this certain kick and a subject, and then after a couple of months, it fades away, and then you, you go do something else, right? And I, my, my heart, my heart has a way of giving itself to what I focus on. Anybody else here with me? When, when Nathan was here, uh, everybody enjoyed Nathan? Yeah. When Nathan was here, he is a huge fan of Old West movies. All right, he loves <laughs> Old West stuff. And so he brought with him his, uh, ah, I hope it's okay if I share this. <laughs> he brought with him his lever action rifle, you know. He bought with him a, a deer gun because he loves shooting. He loves the Old West. And so he, he bought this lever action rifle. And he... That's, he says, I only have maybe one or two, you know, things that I really enjoy, and, and, and shooting is one of them, and he's good at it. He's really good at it. We went out to the farm, and he'd pull those guns out, and he could, well, he's a good, good marksman. Well, I spent a couple days doing that with him. And you know what the next thing I want to do is? Anybody guess? I go to Nat on our date day, and go to Des Moines, go into that Shields, and I start looking at all those guns there. And I tell Nat, I says, you know what, I, I need a gun. <laughs> I need a big gun. <laughs> so a couple of days later, it kind of fades, you know. <laughs> now, I, look, there's nothing wrong with having hobbies, but keep them in, in the light of the perspective they should be in. Because if I were to let my heart, and this is, this is one of these really gray, benign areas where we, we preach things like this in the church, but because they never get defined, it means 20 different things to different people. And we say, just follow your heart. Well, I don't know if that's such a good idea. <laughs> what's, what's in your heart today? Well, it's different than last month, <laughs> different than the month before. At some point, with retrospection, you have to say, I'm not sure that my heart's following God. <laughs> I think it's got its own thing, and it It does. And there's, look, everybody listen to me. It's okay. But you have to, if you're going to follow God, you have to put those things in its prior priority, in its position. There are things, <coughs> okay, over the last seven years, my heart has tried to make me a, a bunch of different things. And, and the one thing that I've learned in this process is that, the, at the, is that God, God is trying to purge out the ability, okay? Not the desires, but the ability of those desires to take me and take me into my own way. Take me out of God's will. Because if I were to follow me, at one point, I thought I needed to be a pilot. Another point, I thought I needed to be a mechanic. Another point, I thought I wanted to be an engineer. Another point, I wanted to get into this and to get into that. And I could list out 10 things here. Some of them I'm a little embarrassed about. Not because they're, they're just a little nerdy, you know, stuff like that. Your heart, your heart can attach itself to stuff. You have to attach yourself to him. And it's a fight. It's a fight. Because it is completely possible, and it's more than possible, it happens all the time, that people follow God for a little bit, and then they get tired, and then they go on to the next thing. In 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they get excited about something. They get excited about hearing his voice for a week or two. They get excited about reading his word for a week or two. They, they may even get excited for fasting <laughs> for a week or two. See? But do you sow to that even when you don't feel like it? Because when you feel like it, it's easy. When you don't feel like it, it's hard. It's a choice. Everybody say choice. It's a choice. I never enjoyed, when we would play football, I never enjoyed any surprise. I didn't like getting up at 5 o'clock. 
lifting weights. I didn't enjoy coming right out of school, you know, my fatigued with tests and homework and going and playing football and running drills and having people yell at me. I didn't enjoy that. But what we do it for, what you do it for, is to play the game, see? And see, Paul said we run, we don't beat the air, we're not shadow boxing, we're redeeming the time, but we run to win a race. See, we run, what, what did Jesus say? For the joy set before him, he endured. Everybody say endured. Endured, endured the cross. See? There is a vision and an image that God's wanting to impart to you of what motivates you has to be bigger than your flesh. Your flesh, okay. Go to, uh, let's see, I believe it's Matthew. Yes, it's in a couple different Gospels, but it's Matthew 26. This is uh, right before Jesus was going to be crucified, Matthew 26, and, and they took communion, and we'll start here in verse 30, Matthew 26, 30, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives, and then saith Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. And in another place it says, I'll die for you. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you just an easy question. Do you think Peter meant this? Do you think he meant it with all his heart? Do you think when he said this, I, everybody else can leave you, I'm not leaving you. <laughs> how many, I had the Holy Ghost when I was reading through that once. He says, how many times have you prayed prayers and felt like you meant it? What did Jesus say? The spirit is willing. Flesh is weak. Everybody say it's a fight. It's a fight. It's a fight. The greatest enemy you face in this life is not the devil. It's the part of you that the devil uses. It's the part of you that won't submit. It's the part of you that doesn't want to be exposed, doesn't want to answer to anybody doesn't want to be wrong doesn't believe it's wrong because we're never wrong right <laughs> in our own heads we're never wrong but we can't all be right can we <laughs> only he's right it's not about whether or not he agrees with you do you agree with him he doesn't come to take sides he is he is the only side he has the truth. If you want to understand truth, you have to have humility. L look at I, the Holy Ghost. He says, do you, you believe he meant this? There's so many of my people that believe they mean what they say when they talk to me. But I can see their heart. Peter answered and said unto them, though all men shall be offended because of thee, I'll never be offended. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me three times. And Peter said unto him, Though I, shall, I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Why was he wrong? Was he wrong? So you can have something in your heart, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean you're strong enough to follow through with it. <laughs> 
see him. <clears throat> what I see in Jesus is that if he, if he claimed dominion over something, it was finished. And you can start out with a resolve. You can start out professing something. But the proof of whether or not you believe it will be seen, will be tested, what your resolve is. Do you know how many times the Lord has led me to fast? And midway through my fast, I hear the Lord tell me to stop. <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> Why? Because God's not, you think God's crazy? No, you're crazy. <laughs> I'm crazy. I hear the call to fast. I go start fasting, and then all of a sudden I find reasons why I can't do it. Because it's a fight. See, I'll set out and I say, I'm going to fast this long. Do you know the first thing that happens is I start to negotiate with myself? You know, really, it's, here, here's, <laughs> uh, let's say it's seven days. We're going to do a seven-day fast, flesh. Okay, well, we've been eating pretty well, so let's go ahead. <laughs> let's go ahead. I'm, I'm in agreement. Let's fast. <laughs> seven days. We hit about one o'clock. I'm okay. <laughs> First day, one o'clock. Two o'clock. <clears throat> I'm Okay. <laughs> If I come to the church and I leave home, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, I'm okay. I come home. Natalie's making something. <laughs> it's not her fault. Here's this voice. You know the flesh. The flesh is, it's, it's tricky. Everybody, you, you know your flesh is tricky, right? It's tricky. The flesh knows the word of God, too. <laughs> So I'm, I've set out to do a seven-day fast, and here's what my flesh will say. He's, well, you know, seven days, you're not going to be able to work out like you wanted to. And really, it's about a lifestyle of fasting. So what we need to do is not do seven days of fasting. You need to have maybe fast one day, and then tomorrow fast another day, and we'll just do those two days, and next week we'll do two more days. And I hear that thinking, I think, you know what, we'll just do two days a week. That's a lifestyle, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to do two days a week. I don't know if anybody else does this with their flesh, but here it comes. You need to have a lifestyle choice, you know, two days a week, two days a week. Do you know I stop fasting and I never get back on? <laughs> I say, oh, I've convinced myself, I'm just going to do today and then I'm <laughs> Everybody with me? Because your flesh... Is weak. Do you know God's not interested in redeeming your flesh? Everything in this New Testament says it's dead. God says it's dead. It's not my child. Mortify it. Get rid of it. <laughs> You're new inside. We're going to get you a new one when you come to heaven. But that thing, that's not my child. Everything that Paul preaches says mortify, 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 mortify. Everything he preaches to the Gentiles, he says mortify it, mortify. This body is not coming with you and the lusts and the appetites and the desires of it. It's not coming with you. So just as well die now and live for Christ. Just as well. See, <clears throat> if we're going to be a people that not just, see, because you ask any Christian, do you want the will of God? Oh yeah, I want the will of God. How much of you is resisting it? Oh, None. I don't believe you because your flesh is your enemy. You have to make it submit. And one of the things that the Holy Ghost has, and I've struggled to apply this to my life, but one of the things the Holy Ghost has been telling me, he's like, do not let your flesh talk. Do not let your flesh decide what you do. If you decide to do something for me, follow through and finish it. Finish it. Isn't that what Jesus said? It is finished. If you're going to do something, finish it. If you declare a fast, don't let your flesh be the one to tell you to come off. Because we give that ground to the flesh, we make it a war. But you have been given the Spirit of Christ, and more than that, you've been given the Holy Spirit. And it says in Romans chapter 8, he says, <clears throat> likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. 
when we don't know how to pray as we ought. The Spirit makes intercession for us. Now, if you look in the context of that, okay, we're going to go there. Romans chapter 8. Go to Romans 8. Now, I, I'm not going to go back and, and tell you what the therefore is therefore. Just know that there's a therefore here, and it's there for a reason. <laughs> you need to see the conclusion, okay? But look at, look, this is the conclusion, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, because of what he said, okay? Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are not, or sorry, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, guess what? You shall die, but if ye through the Spirit do, what is that? Mortify. Everybody say mortify. Mortify is the same, that's the same root word. You get mortician, mortuary. It's death. You mortify. If you through the Spirit, how do you through the Spirit mortify the flesh? That's what Nathan preached on. That you have a new nature, you have a conscience that excuses or accuses every thought that comes into your heart. When something comes in, how do you mortify the flesh? You hear that conscience preach at you what's right and wrong, and you make the choice. The law is written in here now. It's not outside, it's in here. And it preaches from the inside out, telling you right from wrong. When you're transformed to that truth is when you obey your conscience that's telling you what's right and wrong. That's mortification mortification and transformation are brothers you cannot be transformed to the newness of christ the life of christ and not be mortified to that same degree in your flesh because the flesh what does it say in galatians the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary everybody say contrary you got both of them. One of them wants the will of God and one does not. And if the one that doesn't want the will of God wins, guess what? No will of God. It's a choice. It's a choice. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... They are the sons of God. Now, in the context, what he's talking about here, he's talking about the work that's been done in your heart. The Spirit of God here is not the Holy Spirit in this context. The Spirit of God here is the Spirit of Christ that you were raised, you identify with his death, burial, and resurrection, and the Spirit that's on the inside of you has, you are a child of God. You have that new nature that's on the inside of you. And he's saying, look, those that are led by the law of life in Christ Jesus, those that are led by that law, by the conscience, they're the children of God. This, what this implies is that if you have been born again, but you still continue to follow after the flesh, you're not living as a child of God. And this is where those greasy grace preachers come in and say, it's okay, you live how you want. You've received Christ, it's okay, you do whatever you want. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. He didn't come to empower you to sin. He came to set you free from the power of sin. Look at this. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received this. Now he contrasts. You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Where did that spirit come from? It came from Adam. Okay, for you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. We're his children. This is the context. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. He's talking about the new nature in our spirit that he's given us, the spirit of Christ. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby, who is it? We, 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 we cry. Abba, Father. And then he adds the Spirit itself, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit. Our spirit. 
that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. The sufferings he's talking about there is, is not just the sufferings of persecution, but it's also the sufferings of fighting the flesh. Not my will, your will. Not the flesh's desires. Righteousness, holiness. Let's see. Now look at this. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. At this time, is that glory revealed? No, it's not. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Okay? So there is this groaning process. What he's describing here is you have a first fruit. You have the righteousness of the Spirit in you. You're made in Christ's image. And you have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. He now resides in that temple, not made with hands, made by God. The Holy Ghost resides in that temple. And there is a groaning that happens inside this temple that what is righteous on the inside, it is groaning. Let me put a different word. It is fighting this old man, the flesh. It's fighting this thing, and it wants to be redeemed from it. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, mortify, put to death the old man, you're going to live. You see that. <clears throat> and not only, I'm oh, sorry, for we know that the, okay, I'm going to skip. Where did I leave off? Verse 23, we'll start there. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the, re the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Someday we're going to get a new one that's agreeing with the righteousness in our heart. Everybody with me? But not today is not that day. <laughs> for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. How do you with patience wait for it? By mortifying. That's the mortification. That's the patiently waiting, putting to death the old man. Now look at this, verse 26. Here's where the Holy Spirit helps. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, our weaknesses. What weaknesses in the context? The weaknesses of a righteous spirit going to war against the carnal, the carnal appetites, the carnal body. Okay? Likewise, the Holy Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Hello, praying in tongues. When you don't know how to pray as you ought, He will pray for you. What does it say in 1 Corinthians? This is He that prays in an unknown tongue, prays not to men, or does not speak to men, but prays unto God. Howbeit in the Spirit, He's speaking mysteries mysteries to god no mysteries that are to you and you the the whole point of prayer is to understand it so. <clears throat> likewise the spirit also helps our infirmities for we don't know what we should pray for as we ought well how does he pray then <laughs> well, not with our understanding evidently but the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered and he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The will of God. Everybody say the will of God. Yeah. And here's verse 28. The only way you get verse 28 is by applying verse 27 or 26. And we know. This is kind of round robin, okay? This is where the sovereign God people jump on this, on this verse. This is the sovereign God, people. It's not real sovereignty of God, it's heresy. Because if you really believe what God said, you would, you would know what God, <laughs> how God sees you. God gave you choice. 
God gave you freedom. God gave you dominion. That's why he had to run through all these hoops. Why he couldn't just do whatever he pleased. Because you're made in his image and you have a choice. And we know that all things work together for good. What, just everything? No, no. Because the Holy Ghost is praying out God's will for you. Guess what? If the Holy Ghost is interceding for the will of God in your life, you know that all things are working together for good. If you spend time praying in the Holy Spirit, he's going to pray out what you don't know. And you know that if he's praying out what you don't know, he's making intercession according to God's will, not your own. And if he's making intercession according to God's will and not your own, you know that all things, verse 28, are going to work together for good to them that love God and those that are called according to his purpose, not yours. His purpose. The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And I dare say you probably can't ask any Christian in this town, are you opposed to the will of God? And have them say, yes. <laughs> but you have to recognize that part of you is. You have to recognize that the flesh, to the degree that it rules you, it is completely opposed to the will of God. It's completely opposed. <clears throat> mm, I feel that chill. <laughs> Let's go to Romans chapter 4. You know, the power of the gospel and the power of God is that, let me, let me put it to you this way. If somebody never has their flesh exposed, they never have their flesh, flesh exposed, they never deal with it. Is that right? Part of why we preach fasting here in Isaiah, it says that you hide not from your own flesh. And if you go on a fast, you'll find out what's wrong. <laughs> You'll find out your anger and your offendability. And then when it's exposed, you get to deal with it. But if it's always hidden and if it's always justified, how, how much progress are you going to make? If you keep telling yourself, I'm okay. Maybe you're not. <laughs> this culture loves to tell everybody they're okay. They're probably not. <laughs> right. If you... Why we preach prayer and fasting and all these things, they're not works to justify you. Christ justifies you. Prayer and fasting is not about your salvation. Prayer and fasting is about your mortification. It's about exposing those things that oppose God's will. I don't want anything in me to, to oppose God's will. But I know I've prayed prayers like Peter has prayed. I'm never going to leave you. You can find people in situations where they... They, be, they love God, they follow God all their life, they come into a little bit of money and it exposes in a weakness. The reason they had such a strong love of God is because they couldn't take care of themselves. They get a little bit of money and they leave church. Why? Because that thing was in their heart and it got exposed. But you don't have to stay that way. Fasting will help. The Holy Ghost will pray out your weaknesses move you into a place where you can see them and then deal with them. Your life as a victorious Christian starts with overcoming the flesh. You don't need to be praying for other people. No, I mean, you can pray for other people. All right, don't, hear, don't mishear me. But listen, if, if all you're doing is griping about other people, we know who to look at. <laughs> can I put it that way? Can I put it that way? Because if you're praying, the Holy Ghost is going to deal with you. And the first question you're going to ask yourself when there's an offense is, is there anything I've done, Holy Spirit, that's caused this? Is there anything I've done? It's not going to be justification. It's going to be mortification. Amen. Everybody in Romans chapter 4. Okay. Look at uh, 
This, we're going to talk about Abraham here for a minute. We've got a little bit left. Hmm, we'll start in verse 17. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not. Everybody say, considered not. He considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now stop right there. This is, the Old Testament is types and shadows for us so that we can see. Your flesh is called to be mortified. That's the part of you that resists God's will, is it not? When Paul said, mortify the deeds of the body. Here we have a living picture, a living picture of that. That you're not called to literally die, but what you're called to do, Paul said it in, in Romans, is be a living sacrifice. What does a living sacrifice look like? You're alive, but you're dead to live for yourself. You're not living for yourself anymore. You're not. Last week we went through this exercise. A dead man has no ambition. A dead man doesn't get offended. A dead man doesn't need a new car or the new iPhone, <laughs> even though my flesh really wants one. <laughs> the dead man doesn't need those things. He doesn't need the third Krispy Kreme. He doesn't need those things. Everybody with me? A dead man doesn't need that. In, in Colossians, it says, you are, this is Paul, he says, you are dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. And he tells the Colossians, mortify, therefore, your members. Now look here. Look here. Who against hope, verse 18, who against hope believed in hope. How many years of failure did he have painting a picture? How many decades of trying to have a kid in his own ability? Nothing. Who against hope? What's the hope he's against? It's the hope. It's the, it's the false hope. It's the, I have no chance. Against hope, he believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Now, what? Dead. He had no ability to produce an heir. Neither did Sarah. When you reach a place, okay, Jesus said, everybody say Jesus said. Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. Nothing. You know where the church is at? They don't believe that. They believe they can do something. And they're the reason they're in their own way. It's we have to get, look, if Jesus said it, if Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing, what makes you think you can do anything apart from him? There has to come a death to yourself, your own ability, your own ambition, your own goals, your own pride, your own prestige, you of yourself can't do anything. And that's what Jesus says, I of my own self can do nothing. We need to get to that place of death. We need to get to that place of mortification. You need to persecute every part of your flesh that is standing against the will of God. I guarantee you, if you go looking for it, you will find it. I find it every time I sit down to pray. I find it every time I go without a meal. I find it every time I read this word. I find my flesh. And it doesn't agree with God. It doesn't want to pray. It doesn't want to sit there. Anybody else have a flesh? You can join the club. It needs to die. Okay. 
who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. What's the implication? We like to think that Abraham's going to have this child regardless. God's just going to usurp it on him. Do you know if Abraham did not believe there would be no nation of Israel? It's not sovereignty takes over. That's not God. Abraham believed. If you want to deny your part in getting God's will done, you're going to be sorely mistaken when you get to heaven. I don't know why God would give you a reward if there wasn't any choice, but he does. <clears throat> and being, okay, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Our job is not to perform. It's to come to the place where we agree, I of myself can do nothing our job is to be dead enough to believe you can't do anything. You believe God and he does something. Once you're out of the way, God steps in and does what you cannot do. And this is what Abraham did. It's why he's called the father of faith. He being fully persuaded. Why would you add fully persuade? What's persuasion? What is the process of persuasion. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe he was fully persuaded when they tried to hatch that plot with Hagar to have a baby another way? Is that fully persuaded? He was not in a place of believing. He was not in a place of faith. He had <laughs> ability. <laughs> See, if you reach that place where you're dead and you say, I can do nothing of myself, you know all the works that God did through Christ? He didn't, Christ wasn't able to go do those things because he was God. He did those things because he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he appointed his disciples and his apostles to do the same things. And he says, the works that I do, you're going to do also. Why don't we do the same works? Part of the reason is we believe we can do things without God. And we don't fully believe we're not fully persuaded that what he said he'll do, he's actually going to do it. We keep looking for another way other than his way. And there is no other way. Every other, I'm not trying to group us in with religions because God has nothing to do with religion. But you can find other religions that give to the poor, that, that meet the needs, that have wonderful charities and, and funds and and we're called to do those things too. But we're also called to do the things that we cannot do, that only he can do. And as long as you believe that you're the way, he can't do them. And it's the flesh that opposes that. It's the flesh. <clears throat> what I find and what I take as encouragement from this is he was fully persuaded. There was a process that he took he came from a place of not trusting God's word. Because when you're going to go do something on your own, you're not trusting God to do it, you're trusting you to do it, right? He came from that place and he got to a place where he believed God fully. Peter, everybody say Peter. He said he could do it, he couldn't do it. Do you know he got to a place where he did it? He did it. All of the, see, there is a process that you can go on of mortification and transformation and you don't ever have to stop. You don't have to wait for anybody else. Nobody else is holding you back. You can know more word than anybody else. You can be deader than anybody else. You can walk in the gifts because choice, choice. Don't wait for me. Don't wait for anybody else. Don't, don't look at anybody else to decide how much am I going to do this. You run into God as fast as you can because in him all things are possible. With you they're not, but with him they're, you can do quite a bit. And in three years, Jesus turned the world upside down. He never left a single building. 
never built a statue of himself. He didn't write any papers. <laughs> he just did what God told him to do. Your heart, I, I enjoy hobbies and, and having some downtime here and there. And, you know, I, I have little aspirations. But what keeps calling me back is Him. And it's, it's like I'll get tired and I'll go play in the kitty area for a while. <laughs> Mess with the things in this life, you know. Pray a little bit. He says, you know, let's keep going. Like, let's keep pressing on. Let's keep pushing. He is your teacher, the Holy Spirit. He's your tutor. I was talking about football and with this. You know, we had a coach that we were given. And uh, how many of you think that kids will work out without a coach? <laughs> well, those little flesh natures, they're not going to go do all those calisthenics themselves. <laughs> They're not going to go run the miles. Not gonna <laughs> we had this one exercise in football. And it, let me just tell you. Now if you would have told me I would have been doing this, I never would have signed up for it. <laughs> but um, I was in, when I was a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, I was one of those crazy kids that was pretty loyal. And so I was in band and I was in football and I didn't know I should quit, quit one. <laughs> Can't do them both. Uh, but I did. I was maybe one of five in our whole high school that did both. And uh, I, the two weeks before school would start, I'd, we'd get up and we'd have to do seven to nine. You know, it's August. It's like 100 degrees out there. Seven to nine football. Then band had already started. <laughs> we had to run, change, band again, nine to 12. Seven to nine, nine to 12. You get an hour lunch, band again, one to four, and then football, five to seven. Two a days. I, there was rumors, there was a tuba player tried to do that. He fainted <laughs> somewhere in the middle of those two weeks. But I can remember being beat tired and doing 12-hour days like that. And so there'd be these, some of these workouts you'd have, they had what they'd call county fair. And county fair was the dreaded workout because... You had all these stations, you had to do them all, and you were already tired from the first football workout and two band workouts. Band was difficult, in case you don't know, because you had to do marching. You were outside all day. You were on your feet. wasn't sitting inside, cool room. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you'd do county fair, and there was this one station that was the most hated, was that you would put your, a belt around you, and you had a, uh, a railroad tie. And you had to drag those around. Just the last, that's the last thing I want to do. <laughs> At the end of the day. And there was this one railroad tie that was bigger than all the others. Some of them were hollowed out and rotted and 20 pounds. This one was like 60. You know, it was just solid. And you get that one, you're going to go slower than everybody else. <laughs> but see, that stuff builds character. That stuff builds endurance. That stuff builds patience see and you've been given the Holy Spirit and he is your coach and see where did those where does the fruit of all those things show up it shows up at the game when you're in the game and you're in the fourth corner and you've been going hard all night you can keep going I'm not going to quit I got fuel for this when you've done a thousand pass routes and it's second nature to you I can do this in my sleep. See, the Holy Ghost, wh wh why do we talk about this? Because the Holy Ghost is trying to press you into more of Him, more of the Spirit. That there is, you sit for an hour and try and pray and hear God's voice and your mind just fights you, fights you, fights you. Fight it back. It's, you're doing good. Sit there. Hear His voice. There's been times I've sat, I've sat right here for three hours thinking my mind won't stop thinking I still fight it and then I go home fought it all the time never heard God once but I fought it you fight it tomorrow you fight it tomorrow you're going to win if you keep fighting you're going to put it down you're going to beat it and 
you're going to, what does Paul say? He says, mortify the deeds of the body. You, you have the power to defeat flesh in all its form, whether it's sin, whether it's its own ideas, its own aspirations. I've been given a thousand different visions for my life in the last seven years. I'm still here because the Holy Ghost is my coach. And he'll say, just sit there a little bit longer. Your flesh doesn't want to get up. It's okay. Sit there a little bit longer. See, Jesus, he accomplished God's will. He fought his own. He fought his own. Not my will, but your will be done. <laughs> when, when Peter tried to say, you're never going to die. You're not going to go to the cross. He said, get behind me, Satan. He knew who was speaking through him. <laughs> There has to be a strength. And maybe you fail today, you get up tomorrow. Get up tomorrow. Get up tomorrow. If you, if you, maybe you have a challenge reading the word of God. Read it five minutes, put it down, pick it up again. You keep beating that thing. Because it doesn't get to decide. The life of God on the inside you is stronger than that. Amen. You can come to a place like Peter like Abraham, like Paul, fully persuaded, fully persuaded where what you believe is second nature and I'm trusting him. And you get to that place where you say, I can't do anything on my own, but I know somebody who can. And he'll get it done. And you'll be alive to Christ. That's when you're alive, that's revival. Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you so much that you have given us the Holy Spirit. He is our teacher. He is our coach. He is our trainer. He is that, that voice that says you can do it. You can take another step. He is that prayer. He come with that language to help us with our weaknesses, to push us to strengthen us, to pray out your will and not our will. That even if we're confused and we don't know what to do, we can spend time and pray in tongues and we know that you're working out all things for the good. Father, I'm so grateful that you gave us, you gave us the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our coach, to push us, to train us, and to grow that life of God up on the inside of us. To what Jesus said is possible. Is possible. We can do all things. And you said. If we have faith in God. All things are possible. To them that believe. He didn't limit it to the apostles. He didn't limit it to him. He said all things are possible to them, to us, to you who believe. I thank you for taking all the limits and the preconceived ideas and the conceptions off of our mind that says, hold back, wait, stop. And I thank you for giving us each, just like a rocket booster, running us into all that God has for us. We're not waiting for anybody. We're gonna have what you said we can have. In Jesus' name, I thank you for your grace falling on those receptive hearts that we're going to walk like you said we could walk. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You are dismissed.